Welcome to Everyday Buddhism, making every day better by applying the proven tools found in Buddhist concepts. Welcome to episode 31 of Everyday Buddhism, making every day better. You know, I'm getting the next podcast out later than I had hoped, but uh, as I'm sure many of you can uh, relate to, life just keeps getting in the way. But in hopes of clearing some space for a more energetic podcast and writing commitment to those of you who enthusiastically support my work, I took a big step this week. You know, I'm excited to announce that I have given up or retired from my career coaching business while I still keep a life and spiritual coaching practice. It was a scary step, a leap to pursue what I know I should be doing in my remaining years, which I hope will be many, many more. I'm sharing this with you because I feel you cheering me on, and it's not so scary. At the end of each episode, I've always shared a big thank you to all of you who listen to the podcast, who email questions and suggestions, and who contribute comments on one of my Facebook groups, and of course, everyone who donates to help keep the podcast content written, produced, and distributed. And to those of you who donate to keep the Everyday Sangha going, Donate both monetarily, but also donate your time as Sangha members in a wonderful community. Now more than ever, please do consider supporting my work with the podcast and the associated groups. Your help means more now as I make decisions about making the podcast a Patreon group or accepting ad sponsors. You know, I hope we can keep it the way it is now and release more content more often and help me find other ways to interact with all of you. So to set up a recurring, which I hope you will consider, set up a recurring or one-time donation, you go to the donate tab on my website, www.everyday-buddhism.com. And you know, don't forget, if you'd like to talk with me and others about these podcast episodes and other everyday Buddhism subjects, consider joining the Everyday Buddhism Sangha. The Sangha meets live via Zoom video conference every other week, and the details are on the main page of my website. And if you have any other questions about uh, the Sangha, please uh, contact me via the email on my website. So that out of the way, the other news is I'm making progress editing my book and it still looks good for getting it published this year. But whoa, editing is hard work. All along, you know, I thought when I was writing this book, when I got done writing it, it was on to all the fun stuff like, uh, oh, I don't know, finalizing the formatting and cover design reaching out to reviewers, you know, to write a blurb for the back of the book or on Amazon, and then publication, and then celebrate and think about the next book. Sure, I knew, you know, a little editing needed to be done, but I had no idea what book editing entailed. Luckily, though, my friend, an editor, Julie, did know and is putting me through the torture of working with an editor editor and putting our friendship at risk. Just kidding, Julie. But it will be a better book for her insight. Now, my podcasts, however, are unedited. The raw me. It's fun to have, you know, sort of both channels to talk about Buddhism. And I look forward to writing more books. And today, though, I'm going to be talking about one of my favorite subjects, if not my favorite subject in Buddhism, and that's bodhicitta and being a bodhisattva. I just like saying the word bodhicitta. I love the sound of bodhicitta, 
So I'll say it as much as possible in this podcast, just to delight myself. But more about Bodhicitta. <clears throat> in episode six, we talked about right intention, the second of the Eightfold Path. It was in that episode that I believe I first mentioned Bodhicitta. It is Bodhicitta that characterizes the path of a Mahayana Buddhist practitioner. It is Bodhicitta that creates a Bodhisattva. And it is Bodhicitta that ultimately creates a Buddha. As a Mahayana practicer, practitioner myself, and for all the rest of us even noodling around Buddhist study and practice, Bodhicitta is, think of it as a jeweled right intention. Bodhicitta evolves from right intention by the application of right view. Right view helps us be the kind of person who can realize and act on the right intention. When we have right view, we willingly reach a point of renunciation of our past way of looking at things. And that creates a whole new view of ourselves and of, of others and of the world. You know, I think renunciation gets a bad rap. It's, it, 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 it's not like, you know, removing yourself from the world, cloisting yourself away, becoming a monk or nun. Not necessarily. It can mean that. But renunciation in Tibetan means authentic becoming. It doesn't mean living in isolation from the world, but a renouncing of the delusions that keep one from becoming one's authentic self. In other words, a renouncing of the delusions of the world. And becoming one's authentic self means developing or awakening the good heart. And I don't mean excellent cardiovascular shape, although that's a good intention too. No, in Tibetan, compassion is translated as nobility or greatness of heart, which implies both, well, it implies a lot of things. It implies wisdom, discernment, empathy, uh, unselfishness, and abundant kindness. You remember that kind of tender heart? We all had it as children, and I know some of you still have it. It's, you know, that unselfish urge to pick a daisy and hand it to a stranger, the drive to make sure everyone, that means everyone without judgment, is happy. You know, the perfect archetype of this great heart in the Buddhist tradition and in Buddhist mythology is the Bodhisattva of Compassion, who's called Chen Rezeg, who's also known as Avalokiteshvara in Sanskrit, also known as Guan Yin in Chinese and Quan Yin in Japanese. It's a bodhisattva that's considered at point at in some in some um, schools a female and some a male. So he she is pictured in many forms with either four arms or a thousand arms. Chen Rezeg or Avalokiteshvara is said to have made a vow to deliver all people from suffering and help them gain enlightenment. He wished that if he ever hesitated to do so, he would split into a thousand pieces. And at one point, he became discouraged by the great task he took on, and he momentarily thought of giving up. And at that instant, his head shattered into pieces. In his agony, he called out to Buddha, Am Buddha Amitabha to help, and Buddha Amitabha created a new body for him with ten heads and 1,000 arms, so that he could see and reach out to all beings and carry out his work more effectively. What a great story. I bet you sometimes we wish we had a 1,000 arms. I don't know about 10 heads, but sometimes I could use a 1,000 arms. But it is a great story, but on a more profound level, or where the everyday happens, for our purposes, it applies to the practice of right intention. You know, we may have a noble intention, but fulfilling it may prove too hard, like Chen Rezeg. We may become discouraged 
and full of doubt at not at at, at, at our inability to do what we tended to intended to do despite the sincerity of our intentions however if we keep that sincere motivation that good heart and continue in our efforts if we keep trying with our intention guided by right view something happens a more powerful force will enter if we can activate that force in our consciousness and let it fight the function of the amygdala remember that lizard brain part of us that consistently and typically reacts in fear anxiety and aggression it will slowly get stronger and start to guide our thoughts and actions that force that's activated is bodhicitta or the wish for enlightenment for all beings it is activated in our consciousness and begins to guide our thoughts and actions sort of reorganizing us it transforms our view from a selfish view to a right view essentially creating 10 heads and a right view powers our activities and creates an endless capacity so essentially a thousand arms therefore a valakitishvar is a symbol of our own perspective transformed and our own egos shattered by bodhicitta you know if you've ever heard of bodhicitta at all you may have heard it referred to as the wish for enlightenment which i i just actually use that phrase yet it is so much more more than a wish intention without action now that's a wish so there needs to be more to right intention to elevate it from regular intention or a regular wish to the right intention and that's where bodhicitta the boundless heart fits in in bodhicitta our heart and our mind are involved bodhicitta requires right view combined with right intention to awaken to life in order to help others awaken to life so it's not just simply a feeling like uh, kindness or compassion no the mind combines with the heart the mind elevates the heart with right view in a knowing sort of sentiment it's not just a feeling it's a feeling with right view bodhicitta has this knowing or i guess you'd say a vertical dimension of an elevated perspective in addition to that on the ground horizontal dimension of everyday activity activity you know bodhicitta might start with and grow from compassion and that wish to alleviate suffering but it's bigger bigger than compassion and ultimately different than compassion compassion alone which is the heart working without a mind awakened through right view may initiate a social and worldly commitment to doing good as seen in engaged buddhism or social action this compassion focuses on working to alleviate suffering in our world as much as possible through kindness care justice and of course all this is good but does that kind of compassionate wish does that kind of compassion actually end suffering no it doesn't does it suffering still exists there is a bottomless pit of suffering as we look around us on both a personal scale and a universal scale you know friends family and neighbors suffering with illness death financial losses overwhelm social injustice natural catastrophe senseless violence and climate change and that bottomless pit of suffering can trigger anxiety angst depression and even apathy a giving up in the face of all that needs to be done this suffering is part of our human condition 
as defined by the Buddha in the Four Noble Truths. And the Buddha then went on to teach that the only way to end this suffering is when each individual finds the peace that exists at her core, her true self, her Buddha nature. This peace is steady and available despite any physical or emotional circumstance. The Buddha taught that by following the Eightfold Path, you will begin to shake off your ignorance and loosen your grip on grasping to a delusional view of life so that you can become your authentic self. That delusional view of life is what causes us to suffer. And if we can shake that off or try to shake that off, then we can help others do the same thing. You may have glimpsed the peace of your authentic self in meditation or in nature or while just sitting. The wish to help others find this peace is what bodhicitta is. And it is a very different form of compassion than how we typically think about it. Bodhicitta is boundless, expanding beyond a wish, beyond a feeling to that expanded perspective of right view. Bodhicitta is, in fact, the combination or interweaving of the knowledge of emptiness and, and the, the heart of compassion. Bodhicitta is the intention to awaken to this peace, this being in life as it really is, not how we wish it would be, so that we can help others awaken to that same fact too. It is something different than what our social conditioning steers us to do. Our conditioning prompts us to react. Yet bodhicitta prompts us to go higher than our usual automatic reaction to overwhelming emotions or looping thoughts. Bodhicitta asks us to look into a deeper form of knowing a knowing that goes beyond concepts, beyond words, where we experience both compassion and emptiness. When we are able to shake off emotional reactivity and respond only to the situation at hand without quote-unquote trying to be good or trying to fix things for others or fix things for the world, then we are seeing life with right view. And the intention, the right intention that springs from right view enables us to respond to things as they are and not things as our storytelling reactive thoughts and feelings prompt us. The freedom to experience life without reactivity shakes off our focus on the stories of suffering and allows us to focus on the inner peace that is always there for us to access. From that place, from that calm, we will then do what needs to be done without worrying about not doing enough or without worrying about the next thing that may come. By using the four bodhisattva vows, or the four great vows, as they call them, and typically in Zen practice, as a guideline, or as a practice, or as just a reminder, we can access the perspective of that boundless heart of bodhicitta and keep us aligned with right view and right intention. For the rest of the episode, I'm going to talk about these four great vows. I've paraphrased them so that they can work in, in, in our instances, in our everyday Buddhism sort of perspective. But I've done this so that we can use it as a practice, you know, as a tip or trick that I promise in this podcast. So let's look how at how these vows work to generate bodhicitta in everyday life. The first vow is, beings are numberless, may I free them all. This is the typical bodhisattva intent, wanting to free all beings from suffering. And this incorporates the intention or active wish characteristic of bodhicitta. But you know, we know that despite our good intentions to help others, our own stuff can get in the way. 
It's like, you know, that story about jumping into the water to save a drowning person when we're not even a strong swimmer. You know, that intention is good, but without the ability to carry it out, it, it won't be realized. There's a phrase that was used by uh, Chogum Trumpa. It, the phrase is idiot compassion. Now, according to the story, Chogum Trumpa borrowed the phrase from Gurdjieff's teachings, who said that we are all idiots in different ways. I can certainly agree with that. And the awesomeness of Buddhist practice is that it teaches us to recognize that we are idiots in some way or another. And it also teaches us to be okay with that while working at the same time to be less of an idiot. Idiot compassion, though, is, is, is like being nice or being good without truly understanding if that being nice or being good will help or hurt someone. True compassion is ready to cause pain if necessary. Compassion and wisdom are the two oars in our journey as budding bodhisattvas. With only compassion and no wisdom, like an idiot compassion, we row with only one oar. And then what happens? We go around in circles. You know those days you wake up in the morning after a good night's sleep, you know, you're refreshed, you're happy, and you make this intention to, okay, today I'm going to be more patient with my family. I'm going to be nicer to that coworker who snipes at me every day. I'm going to smile more. I'm going to eat healthier, and I'm going to exercise after work. You know those days. Then guess what? Something happens on the way to work. Someone sideswipes our car. Or even before we even get out the door, maybe a family member complains about something you did the day before and gets you in a mood. Or you forgot to do the wash and you don't have any clean underwear left. It really doesn't take much to cause a reaction. You lose your patience, you get angry, and you stop smiling. As you will see in the next vow, vow number two, these reactions are endless. It's our human nature. Don't expect your intention to put a plug in the reaction pipeline. We are human, and the reactions will keep flowing. You know, we've been brought up, and we live in a culture that supports the belief, or I would actually call it a fantasy, that we actually have control over our lives and what happens to us. That is part of the ignorance that is part of our human condition. And that causes us to suffer. Now the second vow, greed, hatred, and ignorance. In other words, all those endless reactions, they are endless. So greed, hatred, ignorance, all our reactions are endless. And in that vow, we vow to abandon the reactions. So the second vow addresses the issues we are up against in wanting to help others find more peace and release the suffering in their lives when we ourselves are struggling with the same problems. We have the same problems because we are made of the same stuff, you know, of greed, anger, and delusion. It is of our nature to have emotions and then therefore re react to them. We become absorbed by the emotions we feel. So let's borrow that metaphor again of the trying to rescue somebody who's drowning. You know, it's easy to see that if we respond in panic to every wave that washes over us as we swim out towards that person you were trying to save, we might not reach the person in time to save them. Or we might drown first. Or we both might drown due to, my, to our own panicked flailing when we get there. Helping to save someone else requires the ability to not cling to our own emotional reactions. We can't control them, and we can't order them to stop, but we don't have to cling to them. So vowing to stop them wouldn't be quite right, and that's not what the second vow says. The second vow says we vow to abandon them. When we abandon something or someone, that something or someone doesn't stop existing. We just walk away, or we stop listening. 
So when we first try to do this, when we first try to abandon our reactions, it isn't easy. The f- but the first step, the first tip, is just to watch our reactions. You can't abandon something we haven't even noticed, right? Generally, without practicing, our reactions have already happened before we even notice them. We've already expressed impatience, got angry, said a bad word. Remember, it's that lizard brain thing again. The first practice is just to try to notice a reaction forming. You know, everyone is different, but there are usually some symptomatic clues that you are about to have a reaction. There's a could be a feeling of heat, a clenched jaw, a flip-flopping stomach, the the quickening of your heartbeat. These are reactions. The first part of them that happen inside of your body, um, no one will know about those if you don't say anything or if, and if you don't shout or if you don't kick something. No one knows but you. But the first step is for you to know and not to react first. Notice how often you have a reaction and what triggers them. You'll be surprised. It's only then that you can walk away and abandon them. Noticing comes first. It gets a little easier with practice. And still, though, you have to keep your good intention. Because without it, you could notice your reaction then say, Oh, what the heck, I'm mad, I'm going to react anyway. So the key is to keep that intention and keep that wisdom in check. Where it's at, And that wisdom is making you or telling you to watch your reactions. I know you've heard this before, but it bears repeating. We can't control what happens to us, but we can create the conditions that make it possible for our emotional reactions to come and go on their own without our clinging to them, without our continuous investment in them. In other words, we we can control what happens to us, but we can control how we react or not react. The more we hook in or hook on to a reaction, the more we invest in its continuation. If we can look at ourselves honestly and be patient with ourselves as we practice unhooking from our stories and reactions, we will eventually see our own confusion and clinging for what it is. With a generous spirit toward ourselves and others, with a a dedication to doing the right thing, and with a meditation or mindfulness practice that helps build a stronger foundation for equanimity or looking at these things, we will eventually begin to strengthen our capacity for wisdom and for bodhicitta. With that wisdom, we can now begin to row with both oars straight and strong, a boat to help others to the other shore along with us. Then, even if reactions arise, we will be able to experience them or look at them without surrendering to them or without suppressing them or trying to control or wrestle with them. Then, like clouds, our emotional reactions will come and go. That third vow says Dharma gates or think of it as the doors to experience are countless or numberless. I vow to wake up to or enter each door of experience while watching my reaction. So you see this third vow is a result of the second. It's tied to the second. If we meet all the circumstances in life without dancing without, without dancing with our own reactivity, then our experience of life changes. A certain spaciousness begins to reveal itself where there was once ongoing fights with emotional reactions. That spaciousness is equanimity. And with equanimity comes peace and true compassion for ourselves and those around us. This compassion isn't forced. It isn't the result of, quote, I vow to be a bodhisattva, but a natural result of the space we've created in our lives when we let the experiences of life 
and our emotional reactions to them come and go naturally. When we let ourselves wake up to or enter all those doors of experience. So that third vow then is revealed. Doors to experience are infinite. May I enter them all? This is how Bodhicitta deepens the concept of compassion with the experience of emptiness or shunata. Bodhicitta then is an experience of awakening, awakening to life not bound by emotional reactions, but with the freedom to walk through every door, every experience, without being frightened of our own reactions. Every reaction opens another door to experience to experiencing life, to experiencing ourselves, a self that's not holding on to or flying off with emotional reactions, and a self who's not fighting with or pushing them away. This is when intention, this is when a, a wish, this is when intention gets supercharged. This ain't no regular intention. This is intention supercharged with wisdom. This is in, in, t- intention charged with dedication and commitment. With this commitment, we know it is indeed up to us to save all beings. We save them by not allowing ourselves to stay asleep in our own ignorance, but to wake up to everything life throws at us and wake up to how we respond to it. When we get practiced at this, we'll notice a shift in our perception, a shift that doesn't hold on to our own or other stories, a shift that doesn't depend on words or concepts, but on our own calm and steady mind. This is the glimpse of bodhicitta, a glimpse of awakening into our own Buddha nature. And that glimpse allows us to see the peace that can be in our mind rather than our usual fight with reactions and judgment of concepts. And it enables us to see ourselves as part of the whole of life. Remember, right view is the understanding and active acceptance of impermanence, interdependence, change, and the emptiness of a discrete or inherent unchanging self, as well as the emptiness of all other phenomena. This is the stuff that supercharges our intentions and supercharges our compassion for others, transforming it from idiot compassion to true compassion. You know, the Diamond Sutra, uh, a a Mahayana Sutra that's part of that broader, uh, what you've probably heard about, Prajnaparamita, or Perfection of Wisdom Sutras. In Sanskrit, it is called Vajra Chetika Prajnaparamita Sutra, which translated is the Vajra, or Diamond Cutter Perfection of Wisdom Sutra, the Diamond Cutter Perfection of Wisdom Sutra, or sometimes called the Perfection of Wisdom Text that Cuts Like a Thunderbolt. That's the funny thing about this word Vajra. Uh, it, Vajra is, is, is a word that connotes strength, but it's equally referred to as a diamond, a thunderbolt, or a powerful weapon. The main thing to take away here is that it's a metaphor for the type of wisdom that shatters illusions and gets to the ultimate reality. The Diamond Sutra has the Buddha teaching of this grasping hold of our minds so that we can watch calmly as our reactions come and go. In the Sutra, the Buddha's senior student, Subhuti, asks the Buddha, how, Lord, should one who has set out on the Bodhisattva path take his stand. How should he proceed? How should he control the mind? Then the Buddha answers to Subhuti by saying that a bodhisattva should have the intention that he should bring all beings to to nirvana. But he continues to say that 
after the Bodhisattva has brought all beings to Nirvana, quote, no living beings whatsoever have been brought to Nirvana, unquote. Okay, I know this seems like nonsense or another one of my Zen Cone adventures, but in fact, this is exactly what I've been talking about. See, if we learn to control our mind, as, as Subhuti asked, we are learning to watch rea- reactions come and go, watch experiences come and go, watch emotions come and go, knowing that is the suchness or emptiness of life. It comes and go. Things come and go. The trick is to not grasp onto them as things that are going to stay here forever, not to reify them and turn them into fixed permanent things or concepts. You know, as I've shared before, one of my favorite teachings and mantras that I took from my sensei, Reverend Koyo Kabose's father, Reverend Gyome Kabose, is this one. He said, quote, every day, one thing after another. So see, that's it. Life is one thing after another, a flowing stream. Stepping into it won't stop it. So as we learn to take hold of our mind, each experience and each person becomes less and less a fixed thing because we have the wisdom that sees people as empty of an inherent unchanging self and not as the beings we thought they were. They're part of this every day, one thing after another. Once we are able to liberate our minds from this concept of fixed things, we then have liberated ourselves from the grasping that leads to suffering and at the same time liberated all other beings. And this takes us to the fourth vow. Ways of awakening are limitless. They're unsurpassed. May I practice what the Buddha taught and know them all. See, the more we practice being with our experiences of life rather than being caught in a cycle of reactions, the more it becomes a natural practice. Once we get the first glimpse of spaciousness when an emotional reaction arises and then passes away without our involvement, the more we are determined to experience watching rather than reacting to emotions again and again. This is a freedom unlike anything else we have ever experienced. It's like the freedom of a flower who blooms without thinking who deserves to experience its beauty and who does not. It freely offers its beauty and its fragrance because that's what it does. The flower doesn't you know, cling to its struggle as a bud under the heavy weight of spring snow saying, oh, poor me, look at what I've been through. No, the flower doesn't worry if people walk by and don't notice it or if it's growing in a sidewalk crack. The flower doesn't worry about when it will be cut down by the first frost. Now, compassion in the normal walking in the world everyday way we view it is a desire to free others from the suffering of this this world, pain, illness, hunger, fear, and oppression, through our kindness and our care. The compassion of bodhicitta is compassion with wisdom. It needs the wisdom that knows suffering is alleviated only through the peace of equanimity, the peace of meeting every circumstance in life with as little reaction to it as possible. When we have glimpsed that peace, we have glimpsed the awakening that the flower naturally has, that our Buddha nature naturally is. We have the same freedom as the flower to bloom despite our circumstances. We bring others peace and beauty naturally, no matter who they are, or what they think, or what they do. We never think that way. We respond naturally to whatever arises, like a beautiful flower. May it be so. Thanks again for all your support, your email, your comments on my Facebook group, 
And please do consider supporting my work through an ongoing or one-time donation at the Donate tab on my website, www.everyday-buddhism.com or take a look at the Everyday Sangha. I think you'd you'd enjoy it. It's a way to uh, talk about what we talk about here in this podcast with you as a member, an involved member who can ask questions. Until next time, keep making your everydays better.